welcome to the Water Channel podcast, a series of conversations on water, food and agriculture. We feature stories and insights that are defining our present and are shaping our future. I am Abraham Abhishek. Data drives our day-to-day lives like never before. We use GPS to guide us while driving. We use weather apps to check if we should take our umbrella along when we go out. A lot of this data that we use to organize our lives comes from satellites perched hundreds or in some cases a couple of thousands kilometers above the Earth in space. So naturally, the business and the science of water management is no different. Water resources such as lakes, rivers and even groundwater are being monitored more and more and in many different ways. A lot of this is done remotely using satellites and drones. Ground-level monitoring of these things is often done in ways that involves generation, consolidation and analysis of vast amounts of data. How does that work? Of course, the answer is technology, sophisticated technology. But broadly speaking, what's kind of going on behind the scenes, inside computers, up in the satellites? To what extent does all this technology, all this data reach people doing water management on the ground? And how should we treat the vast amounts of data being generated about natural resources that impact us all? Who owns it? Who should have access to it? What way of managing it would stimulate most innovation, give rise to the most amount of solutions? One of the best people to answer this particular set of questions is Hans van der Quast, Senior Lecturer in GIS and Spatial Data Management at IHE Delft in the Netherlands. And it so happens that we have him with us right here on this podcast. Hans, thanks for your time. Really appreciate that. For starters, just to get off the blocks, there are all these different terms that are used and perhaps some of them wrongly. Uh, there is GIS, there is Earth Observation, there is um, Remote Sensing, there is Spatial Data. What do these different terms mean and how exactly are they different from each other? Okay, yeah, let's start with uh, defining what is GIS. Um, because GIS is not a specific uh, software. Um, people normally relate it to one specific software, but it's everything related to how you deal with uh, spatial data. So that is um, the acquisition, the analysis, uh, processing, but also visualization, uh, and presenting spatial data. Uh, remote sensing is uh, part of the GIS ecosystem. So remote sensing uh, relates to sensors that uh, are not in touch with objects. And with remote sensing, these sensors, they measure parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. A difficult word, but very easy to explain because with uh, you're using it every day. With your eyes, you see three colors of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's red, green, and blue. But um, we are a bit uh, limited as human beings because there's much more. and you're also using it there's uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum there's also the parts that we use for communication like the mobile phones or even the microwave that you might have in your kitchen so these are parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot observe with our eyes but that's around us now for earth observation we need certain parts of that electromagnetic spectrum um, and we can make it visible by translating it to red, green, and blue that we can see with our eyes. So for example, if we look outside like here, and maybe you at home can also do that, you will see uh, plants and you will notice that the leaves are, uh, with a healthy plant, they are green. But for remote sensing people, the leaves are not green. They're very near infrared, (laughs) but we cannot see that with our eyes. So therefore we need sensors that can measure the near infrared. And in able to visualize that, we need to visualize that in a color, red, green, or blue, that we can see. So we need to replace one of those colors with some signal that we then visualize with that color. So what then is spatial data? Yeah, well, if you ask a GIS expert like me, uh, you could also ask, is there anything that is not spatial? So, uh, for example, you do a project somewhere in the world, then you can tag uh, the location of the project or the multiple locations where the project takes place. If you give a presentation about a case study, it has a location. A sample in the lab comes from somewhere, it has a location. When you walk around with your smartphone, your location is captured. So anything that can be linked to an X and Y uh, coordinate or a Z coordinate additionally, 
um, is a spatial location. So spatial data is the kind that contains information about the location of a certain data point? Point, line, polygon, pixel, <laughs> voxel, uh, mesh. So there are many formats that we use in uh, GIS. You've already begun to explain this, but uh, if you could talk a bit about what is it that satellites do that uh, enables them to observe and monitor things uh, on the Earth from thousands of, of miles up in the air. Of course, the technology of it is very complicated and uh, perhaps beyond the scope of, of this podcast. But if you could lay out uh, in terms that a lay person can understand, what uh, exactly is it that happens when satellites observe uh, things on the Earth? Yeah, first of all, these sensors can also be used on Earth. So you can use them in the laboratory and they're normally uh, also developed for use in uh, the laboratory. They uh, consist of uh, spectrometers. Basically, it captures the reflection of sunlight from an object or the emission of objects. So let's um, explain emission first. Every object which is above zero Kelvin, above the absolute zero, emits uh, radiation. So you and I are radiating at this moment and the, there are some physical laws, the law of uh, Wien, that can uh, be used to estimate uh, where which wavelength uh, belongs to a certain temperature of an object. Uh, that's the, the maximum wavelength at which it radiates. So for you and me, that is in the thermal infrared. So we can measure that um, from, uh, with sensors that are sensitive to the thermal infrared. If we talk about uh, red, green and blue again, and that's the interesting thing, uh, that is where the peak radiation of the sun is. If we apply this uh, law of Wien, we will find out that for the sun, the sun has a temperature of around 6000 Kelvin, that the peak radiation is in the red, green and blue. So you can imagine that through our uh, history, our eyes have adapted to see that because in prehistoric times we had to run away from animals and pick the correct berries. So our eyes have ad adjusted to see red, green and blue and that's exactly the peak of the emission of solar radiation. Now that solar radiation hits the earth and reflects back to our eyes. Now, it can also reflect back to a sensor on earth but it can also reflect back to a sensor in space and that's what a satellite sensor does. So for uh, earth observation in the what we call optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum, we um, sense the reflected solar energy and uh, the sensor uh, captures that in different uh, bands or channels. So there's a channel for red, for green, for blue, the ones that we can see, same as our eyes, they have receptors for red, green and blue. But there are also parts of the spectrum uh, in those sensors, which we cannot see, but that are registered like near infrared, shortwave infrared, thermal infrared, etc. I'm limiting myself now to the optical sensors because there's much uh, more like uh, microwave sensors and uh, the thermal infrared. As a layperson, I find it fascinating that there is not much uh, by way of uh, dissipation or absorption that happens to the radiation that is traveling, let's say from a tree to the satellite above as it travels uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, going through different layers of the atmosphere. It stays intact enough so that when it reaches the satellite, the satellite is uh, able to detect that tree. Unfortunately, uh, not. <laughs> there are complications. First of all, uh, we have uh, the effect of the atmosphere. So you can imagine the light that is emitted by the sun, so not by the tree. It travels through our atmosphere hits the tree and then it reflects back through the atmosphere back to space. So it crosses the atmosphere two times. Uh, and the atmosphere consists of gases that absorb part of the energy. But there can also be clouds that hamper uh, the reflection and in the optical part of the spectrum that is a problem. Um, that's one problem. The second problem is that uh, we have to capture that uh, energy and discretize it into uh, pixels because we will not observe that individual tree. We will observe uh, 
something in a discretization, uh, maybe uh, for Sentinel uh, images that's 10 by 10 meter pixels, or we can have it at 30 by 30 or anything. Um, that means we get an average reflection of that footprint on Earth. So there will be part three, if we look outside here, a part soil, a part uh, some urban uh, uh, stuff. And that will give us, so when that information or when that electromagnetic uh, reflection um, is captured by the sensor, uh, we get that mixture. And then we need to find out what we can do with that mixture and we need to correct for the atmospheric um, processes that happen. How long have we been using satellites to monitor water resources on Earth? Well, I think Earth observation um, really became um, mature in the 70s with, uh, when the Landsat program started. Um, so we can have with Landsat the longest uh, time series of Earth observations in the optical uh, spectrum. Um, but later, of course, uh, the technology became better. So more of these spectral channels were added, which uh, is important to distinguish uh, differences in reflection be uh, between objects. Uh, but also resolutions, spatial resolutions have been improving, so which means um, more details can be observed spatially. Um, if we look specifically at water, that is... Um, I think um, a bit more um, specific than uh, land cover in general. Uh, water absorbs a lot of the energy, uh, while uh, many objects reflect a lot. If you look at uh, the urban environment, we get a very high reflection rate, bare soil. But the more moisture, the lower the reflection rate. And if we look at the water, we see that uh, water absorbs a lot of energy and does not reflect much. So in satellite images, if you just simply look at it in the uh, red, green and blue part of the spectrum, you will see uh, that water shows up uh, very dark, meaning that it absorbs a lot of energy. There is GIS analysis, GIS work that happens uh, on a computer. And then there is water management uh, that happens on the ground. Is it the same group of people doing both those things or, or are those two very distinct communities of practice over the years uh, has any diffusion happened between the two how is it in this regard and what do you think it should be like ideally um, people should know each other's uh, discipline so um, our students uh, for example they learn uh, doing field work and also link that to GIS and remote sensing I think if you're only educated in doing one part of it, so if you're only collecting field data, um, then you might not know much about what happens with processing. But the other way around is a bit worse. So if you are a modeler or you're a desktop remote sensing analyst, then yeah, how do you judge the data that you get from the field? So ideally, you know a bit of, uh, of all the different parts. And nowadays, with all the devices that we have, we can run our GIS uh, from the smartphone in the field and even use it in data collection. So not anymore with paper and pencil and with disconnected sensors. We can connect everything to each other and uh, have it in our um, on servers and use that for further uh, processing. So I think it's coming closer together. Uh, but in the education system, I think we should always educate uh, people in GIS and remote sensing to also do the field stuff. And the nice thing is that other experts uh, that I know in GIS and remote sensing really love field work. So we are often seen as computer nerds doing everything at the desk. That's partly true, but we also love field work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about you? How do you plan your work? How much do you like to mix up field work with uh, desk work? Oh, that's a difficult question uh, because it depends a bit on the, on the career path. The uh, the more um, further you get in the in your career, uh, the less chances you get to do the real on the ground stuff, the real field work. So basically, I see my role in uh, educating people in uh, GIS remote sensing using open source tools, uh, providing them the tools to do field work. Um, but I see there's lack of time in the curricula to, to integrate that. So basically, I produce a lot of materials that people themselves can find uh, on my YouTube channel or uh, using my book. Um, so I think my role is translating the state of the art uh, technology together with my knowledge and uh, make that accessible for a wider audience to, uh, to use. Mm 
Looking back at your career, can you think of any examples of applications of uh, GIS, of Earth observation work that you thought were particularly good that you would consider as uh, examples of some of the best practices going around? I think a classic thing in remote sensing is to um, to create uh, land use land cover maps because uh, study areas they are can be large and um, you might not be able to classify the land use land cover by hand. So what you do is you sample certain uh, fields and uh, you collect, you write down or put it in a field form on your mobile phone, uh, all the information you need to do the classification of all the fields that you have not visited uh, from your desk. And uh, by learning how well that uh, workflow works, uh, the better results you will get. So there's some good practice you can do in the field when you, for example, want to make crop maps. It's okay, choose the right uh, season. Um, write down the, the stages of the crops, but also interview the farmers. What was growing here before and what are you planning after? Because you need to be very lucky to have the satellite image at the same moment due to atmospheric conditions and uh, scheduling of the images. And then uh, to have enough samples and a good spread. And then uh, behind the desk, um, splitting the data set in um, a set that you use for training of the classification algorithm, choosing the correct algorithm and uh, a set from the field that you use for calculating the accuracy of your map. And I think this is the basics that everybody who is in remote sensing for land use land cover analysis needs to know. And um, people might think that uh, remote sensing is the, the holy grail. It sounds super fancy. And um, I always make the joke that remote sensing is not rocket science, but literally it is rocket science. There's a rocket needed to bring the satellite up. Um, but it's definitely not the holy grail. There are so many things that you need to take care of and corrections. So what I described earlier with capturing the reflection from Earth, that is just a value. But how do you translate that in information? Um, the sensor does not sense land use land cover. So there's a lot of modeling and processing where you need GIS and remote sensing knowledge to translate what you uh, sense with the satellite into information that can be used for water management um, and for other applications like uh, agricultural applications. Could you tell us something about the SDI project at IHE? Yeah, SDI stands for Spatial Data Infrastructures. And... Um, in the 90s, we have seen that many projects have set up databases and um, we've seen that they were not very successful. And people who worked on those projects in the past, they are very critical to, uh, to do these things again with so-called SDIs. But they forget that an SDI is much more than just a database. An SDI, as the word says, is an infrastructure. So you should imagine that um, if you go from your home to your work, um, it would be really silly if you pave your own road. That's an infrastructure that is provided by the community, by the government, by the, uh, you as a taxpayer. And to use that road, there are some rules. There are the, the code for, for using the road. Um, but the road does not dictate how you use the road. So you can use a bicycle, you can use public transport or your own car, you can walk. So you need to see a spatial data infrastructure as a common investment in an infrastructure that uh, does not determine exactly how you use it, but that provides the infrastructure to, like with a road, to move data in an easy way from uh, uh, one user to the other and to applications. And the way that this works is um, using open standards. So um, you should see these open standards as a universal uh, plug. If we travel the world, and you know at IET we have people from everywhere and we do trainings abroad, then uh, one annoying thing is that uh, your power plug never fits. So we always bring this universal power plug. Without that, we will be uh, hopelessly lost with all our electronic equipment that we use these days. So with these power plugs, it's some kind of national pride. So maybe you would think, hey, why didn't we solve this as humanity to have one single power plug for the whole world but it's some kind of pride that you know yeah which one do we choose then so we gave up on that therefore we use the universal power plug the same uh, you could do with spatial data you can say everybody has to use one product 
but people are not going to do that and there's commercial uh, interest there's open source so with the open standards from OGC the open geospatial consortium we basically say hey you can connect using these so-called APIs um, and therefore we can easily visualize maps from a server on a mobile phone use it in a model and in your GIS or even in uh, Google Earth um, so as long as software uh, obeys those rules of open standards then we can be very flexible and link things there are open standards for how sensors communicate with uh, servers um, so that opens up a whole world without uh, asking everybody to change because you know that's the most difficult thing to ask people and software to change so SDI is a repository of a large amount of data but it is also an articulation of certain standards certain open standards and at the height of its aspirations those standards are universally or nearly universally followed uh, so that the SDI can take on absorb and make available um, large amounts of data and information in an uh, open manner is that kind of close to a good understanding of it yes uh, there are some additional components that are important with an SDI so a user wants to search for data in uh, a catalog so let's assume you are interested in uh, rivers in, uh, in India, then um, you would simply use the search engine of the spatial data infrastructure, which is a catalog function, uh, also following standards, um, where you give that geographical limit and uh, some keywords on what you search, and it should give you then back all the data sets that uh, relate to that. Um, then the next thing as a user, you want to... Um, to read the so-called metadata and this is very important uh, because just putting all the data in a database and then people can't find it you know you need to document it and we call the documentation metadata metadata is about uh, what are your rights to use it who produced it um, some indication of quality it can contain links to reports where about uh, the data uh, how it was produced um, which units, the projection, all these things uh, should be mentioned in the metadata. So the user has a good view on what the, you can do with the data. And this is often a misconception. People against sharing often have the argument like, yeah, we produce data, but people are going to use this in the wrong way. Well, I can tell you, most innovations take place when people do things with the data that you didn't come up with. So you should not be paternalistic about it and simply describe the limitations of the data, how it was produced. And don't be afraid that users will then do wrong things with that. Because if you are clear about what the data is, then you are not liable about how the user is going to use your data. So having it out in the open with the metadata, the user can decide. Now, once the user finds the metadata okay and fit for purpose, then they also want to visualize it before downloading and using it. So an SDI also has a web portal part where you can um, really see the data and uh, query and see what attributes uh, are there and um, nice visualizations or infographics. And then finally, the user can make up uh, the mind to say, okay, and this is good for my uh, purpose for modeling or for um, including into uh, story maps or those things. And then... Um, yeah, then we have the whole uh, workflow. So the big difference with the 90s is it's an infrastructure that provides all this functionality and it's not just a database. If I wanted to use the SDI, let's say tomorrow, uh, how would I do that? Would I have to access it through a browser or through an app? It depends on how you want to use it. If you are looking for data, then I can give you an example. There's the FAO uh, Vapor. They call it database. But to me, as a specialist, I call it as SDI because it has all the elements it has a catalog functionality with, which describes each data set. You can connect uh, through the open standards, the OGC standards, the APIs. Um, and I can, in that way, I can search the data through their uh, portal on the web, but I can also use, for example, the WAP plugin in QGIS to uh, download the data, clip it to my area of interest and use it locally on my uh, desktop. I can uh, use it on my mobile phone. I made an app uh, where you can uh, use uh, Vapor data from your mobile phone. Now, this is all just possible because um, it uses these open standards. 
why is openness so important? Why is open data and open access uh, so important? And uh, I ask you this because uh, it is a value, it is an idea that is reflected not just in the work that you do as part of the SDI project, but in all the teaching and all the other online activities that you do, you seem to place a lot of emphasis on the idea of openness. Why? Yeah, first we have to uh, define what open is. So uh, open in the sense of open data, open source, open access stands for the freedom not to only use these products, um, but also to reuse it. So for example, in GIS, if you would um, find data uh, in a PDF, a map, then that is not really open because you cannot use the data for further analysis. You need to do a lot of effort to get the data out of the PDF. You probably need to digitize it if it's, uh, uh, if it's a picture. Um, an easier example is if you find um, a graph in a report. That's not open data. How do you do analysis on a graph that is printed in a document? You need the data and it's very difficult to get the data in that way. So reuse is important. Now I mentioned already different uh, varieties of open things. So there's open data. People often say open source data, that's wrong. So there's open source software, there's open data, and there's open access publication, and there's open education. So if we talk about open data, it means data can be reused. If we talk about open source software, it means the source code is uh, freely available. And you can check the software or the model, and you can contribute to it, and you can uh, reuse it. Uh, depending on the open license that is used as freely as possible. And with open access, um, you can uh, download the publication. With open education, uh, you can uh, download, follow tutorials uh, for free. And uh, even if the uh, license, the real open licenses uh, permit, that you can also reuse it in your own education and improve on it. Now, what the big advantage is of open source software is that you can contribute, you can be part of it. So if you find a model that has been developed and you find mistakes or you want additional features, you can be part of it. The, the code is normally stored in uh, repositories. A very famous one is uh, GitHub. So the whole source code of QGIS can be found on GitHub. And if you find a bug, you can uh, file it there and um, uh, people uh, might look at it. But if you can program, you can also fix it yourself. Um, so it's a very open and transparent way of working. And one misconception with open is, is that we just pitch it as, oh, great, free technology. Nothing is really free in the world. So we need to think about the business model and the value chain. So there are two concepts I would like to introduce. I'm not saying that every data in the world needs to be open. Because there are business cases where you can ask a, a payment for uh, data. So most of the data that is collected uh, comes from governments and they are paid by taxpayers. So it would be ridiculous that as a taxpayer, you need to pay again to access the data from the government. It's already paid for and they are in function of ourselves, of citizens. But if um, the data is available and private sector can add value to the data, like uh, correct it or uh, add functionality to the data that users need, then you could ask uh, some money in exchange. I can give you an easy example. If we have uh, maps with roads, you can now freely download that from OpenStreetMap. But in some of the countries where I work, the National Mapping Agency has uh, roadmaps that you need to pay for. And the citizens don't know that there's something like OpenStreetMap where you can download all the roads for the whole country for free. So that's not what, what they should do. But you can easily add value to roadmaps. What about adding traffic conditions for areas which suffer from floods? Maybe you want to uh, see if some bridges are still accessible. What about um, condition of the road itself or where um, uh, even people are checking, police is checking, you know, we are sometimes interested in that stuff. Well, people want to pay for that, they can avoid fines. So, and related to water, I think uh, accessibility because of flooding and uh, weather conditions, that's all value you can add to, uh, to data like roadmaps. Uh, we call that the value chain. So you go from raw data, which in fact you can just give it away, 
And then if you add value and the more value you add and by combining it with other open data and linked open data as a big concept, then yeah, you add more and more value. And with roadmaps, probably in the high end uh, of added value is to include that into uh, dashboards of uh, cars or in in-flight uh, systems where you can follow your flights. And I've seen uh, OpenStreetMap being used on, uh, on flights in the screens that you have in your seat. So if I get you right, if I understand you correctly, open data is good. It is desirable because uh, it creates uh, certain opportunities, uh, certain possibilities that would otherwise not be created. And not because it's an act of philanthropy. It's not as if when you're making data openly available, you are doing somebody or the world in general a favor. Is that kind of correct? Yeah, indeed, that's the main uh, misconception that uh, we people in open source are a bunch of hippies. Um, we all run uh, companies and uh, everybody plays a part in it. So if we look at open source software, for example, um, if a company needs a feature, they can uh, contract uh, a consultancy that makes the feature. And we have the condition then that uh, what is made is then freely available for the whole community as open source. And that's uh, the way we work. So. Basically, we can earn money with providing those services. Same for, for IHE, you know, we give courses on open source software. These courses are paid, but we try to be fair and also contribute something back to the open source community. So for QGIS trainings, we offer the official QGIS certificate, uh, which contributes uh, 20 euros uh, per participant to the QGIS uh, project. And we are uh, the largest institute issuing um, these certificates and we have issued more than 1,000 certificates since the beginning. And it's a win-win. The participants like official international certificates. QGIS gets income from it and for our institute it's really something good to do to uh, give something back to the software that we use in our education. Does the application of GIS vary across, uh, for lack of a better term, the richer countries and the less rich countries? Is it that GIS is resource intensive, financial resource intensive, technology intensive? So because of that, is it so that the more developed countries are in a better position to use and apply these tools compared to the yet developing countries? Does it break down neatly along those lines or is it a bit more blurred? I think it's blurred, but it's good to clarify a few things there. Um, first of all, um, the uh, licenses versus open source, I think uh, it's, a, it's a paradox at the moment so, because in the past we have been teaching um, people from the global south in using these commercial packages because nothing else existed. Uh, me, myself, I was also educated in the, uh, the dominant uh, software for GIS uh, for which my university where I studied still pays uh, 80,000 euros per year on license costs to use all this remote sensing and GIS uh, software. And we kind of locked in or colonized our Global South partners in that. While in Europe things have changed, we see a tendency uh, that uh, open source software becomes more and more uh, popular and that uh, educational institutes and research institutes become a partner in the communities developing that software. And it's also a cultural thing. We are probably in Europe more used to do voluntary work. So we go for our own interest to uh, what we call hackathons or hack fests to uh, sit there on our own money in our own time to contribute to something nice and meet nice people. So I try to stimulate that for the Global South by um, presenting how that works to our students, but also uh, my book has a fund. My income from the book doesn't go into my pocket, but there's, there's a fund hosted here at IHE to uh, support uh, students, especially female students from the Global South to uh, join uh, these open source GIS events and uh, to open up that world like you don't need to have um, a contract for everything some things give benefit to you uh, on a level that it feels good but also that it opens up the network and opportunities and this value chain for you too so a different way of working now it's very hard because um, conservatism is everywhere also uh, in the netherlands it's hard to switch from uh, proprietary software to uh, to open source, but the same is in uh, the Global South. I've lost projects because people really insisted to use the dominant software, commercial software. Well, we know in, in the, these countries, most people use uh, cracked versions. 
Back in the 90s, I had less a problem with cracked versions because open source did not exist or was not at uh, the point of, uh, uh, of, of competing with uh, commercial software. But now there's absolutely no reason to go for the commercial software. Um, I think all the functionality that we use um, can be found with open source uh, software, not limited to one product, but a whole set of open source tools. Now, the second problem um, or, or, or challenge is um, a tendency of going from having the software and the data on your own computer versus having it in the cloud. And that's an interesting one. And I think we are in a transition that will take uh, a lot of time and it is not necessarily bad. So I think at this point we need to bet on both horses still. And we need to re be really conscious under what conditions you think the user or the researcher wants to use something. So I, and I think not much is said about it or studied, uh, but I, I thought a lot about it. Um, let's go to a condition um, in, in Europe where we have good high bandwidth internet connections. Then um, still both solutions make sense. You want to uh, maybe download huge data sets. You have the capacity to use uh, high bandwidth to download uh, gigabytes of uh, satellite images to your own uh, computer. You can afford uh, hard disks and you can process that with uh, desktop software like QGIS or Python scripts, uh, GDAL, very uh, uh, important software for translating data sets and uh, reprojecting. Um, but we could also, with our high bandwidth, uh, use it in the cloud without downloading because we have permanent internet connection. And uh, we can use, for example, Google Earth Engine, which has uh, petabytes, you cannot even imagine, of data, uh, which saves us a lot of time downloading it. Now, if we move this uh, setting to, um, to a sub-Saharan African country where the bandwidth is low, then you could say, OK, you can work in the cloud but then uh, to work in the cloud with um, online uh, processing of the data, you need uh, almost a permanent uh, connection. So if your condition is that you have a permanent connection but a low bandwidth, I, I would say then the cloud is the best solution because you, you might have a slow connection, but you don't need a high bandwidth connection. You can simply code in the web interface and run it on the servers of of Google, Microsoft, Azure, and all these other uh, providers, uh, ESA, uh, or your national uh, computer infrastructure. AWS? AWS, that's from uh, Amazon, yeah. So, um, but in many cases, we have this on-off kind of connection <laughs> and low bandwidth. In those cases, things become difficult. So there, I would say, you, might, you still would like to use um, a synchronization when your bandwidth is available or your internet connection uh, and then you download what you need when you process it locally and also if you're in the field and you don't have internet connection so then you could imagine systems that work like uh, Dropbox so you synchronize when you have a connection and when your connection is gone or you're out in the field and you don't have access to the internet grid, then you can still process the data, you can do your stuff. And once your connection is back up, it will synchronize again. And these systems uh, can be incorporated in uh, spatial data infrastructures uh, where you can work hybrid. And for many countries, for uh, I think still uh, in the, the coming uh, decades, this is uh, important. So I don't think desktop GIS software and having your own computer with good capacity uh, will become obsolete soon. Mm -hmm. And the, I think we should invest a lot in these common infrastructures. And I know that uh, this is happening and these are priorities. So also the European uh, Union is doing that. There's GEOS. Um, there's, uh, of course, big tech that has that infrastructure. So we need to educate people not to set up these infrastructures themselves, but how to use it, how to use the open standards, how to connect to it. But on the other side, we should still um, educate specialists in how to uh, install uh, and use GIS and remote sensing software on their own computers because of the online offline conditions, the intermittent conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hans, you promote, you promulgate, you propagate uh, open access software. As a result of that, have you ever gotten any pushback from companies that produce proprietary GIS software or from interest groups? 
That's a good question. I don't think uh, the software companies need that pushback because the people, the conservative people do the pushback. So I've lost projects uh, where in the design phase, we all agreed like these are the topics and great course design. But then in the last stage, they ask the, the beneficiaries uh, to do a final check and they say, well, the course is uh, fine, but we really want to use the proprietary software. And then uh, given my uh, reputation in the open source world, I refuse to do that. Since 2013, I don't use the proprietary software anymore. And I, people hopefully see me as a GIS specialist. So I also want to prove that I never have to fall back to that proprietary software. So I can do all my work using all the open source components that are around and even develop scientific tools on that. So I have my own uh, QGIS plugin, the PC Raster Tools plugin, and um, yeah, a lot of things that I can contribute uh, to that. Hans, what's your book called and where can we find it? My book is called uh, QGIS for Hydrological Applications. The second edition is uh, now out. And I wrote it together with uh, Kurt Menke, who works for uh, Septima in uh, Denmark. It's a great cooperation with him. Um, and uh, the publisher is Locate Press, which was uh, um, established also by uh, and owned by Gary Sherman, the inventor of QGIS, uh, the, the guy who started QGIS as a project and never could imagine how big it is these days. And um, you can uh, download the ebook um, if you go to the website of the publisher. Um, and uh, the price of the book is not very high, and there are regular uh, discounts. So if you subscribe to the newsletter, uh, you will be informed about uh, discounts. And the hard copy uh, will be out very soon. And uh, yeah, it's also nice to have a tangible hard copy because it's uh, full of computer exercises. To have the book next to you is easier than have it as an ebook on your screen. And if you see me somewhere in the world on a conference or in a project, then I'm happy to sign the book. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Hans. You're welcome. <laughs>